Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mark McClellan from the Brookings Institution, where I uh, direct the uh, Dr. Richard Merkin Initiative on Payment Reform and Clinical Leadership. And on behalf of us at Brookings and the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to today's webinar on practical strategies for integrating clinical and community asthma innovation with sustainable payment. Uh, that's a mouthful, but I'm going to get in a second to uh, why we're focusing on this topic. Right now, I just want to make sure that for those of you who are joining, uh, if you are not already connected, not only on the phone but on uh, the Internet, that the information for this webinar was available on the invitation. Uh, and if you just click on that link, you can go to a WebEx uh, presentation. That will include slides and ability to send us comments and questions anytime along the way. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, I'd like to get right into this important topic. In recognition of Asthma Awareness Month, we've gathered a broad range of experts here to provide some insight on how to implement practical strategies to enable local clinical and public health leaders to work together more effectively to improve the lives of people with asthma in their communities. Now, this idea of uh, alignment is a core part of our work here at Brookings and a core part of the collaboration uh, with the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America uh, that is, uh, ha has led to today's uh, webinar. Uh, alignment is, uh, is, as we're thinking about it, is between what really works in preventing the complications and improving the health uh, of people with con chronic conditions like asthma uh, and uh, aligning those aspects of clinical care and public health support with the payment systems and the resources that are available in our healthcare system and in the communities to support better care and lower costs. And we're particularly pleased to be focusing on asthma, not only because it's a, a leading public health problem in this country, but it also prevents some of the best opportunities for the leading solutions on better integrating clinical and public health services through financial alignment. So we've got a number of uh, uh, perspectives on this topic today. We're going to start by hearing from Ms. Joy Krieger from AFA St. Louis, who will provide a real-life case example of a successful asthma intervention that she's helped to deploy in her community involving schools, pharmacies, and case management, bridging the gaps between community health and uh, better clinical outcomes and better clinical care. Then we're going to hear from Dr. Carrie Sennett, the president and CEO of AFA, who will discuss the challenges surrounding providing optimal asthma care and opportunities that communities have to better position their programs to make stronger and more visible linkages to get that uh, alignment in place. After that, we're very pleased to be joined by Dr. Stephen Shaw, the Medicaid Medical Director uh, at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, who will describe the ways that CMS is aiming to str provide stronger support for state partners and alternatives and uh, to uh, traditional payment mechanisms to support the kind of alignment that we're describing today. Then to wrap up by these presentations, Dr. Steve Farmer, Brookings Visiting Scholar and Merkin Fellow, will highlight some of the key themes and provide some overview of strategies for sustainable payment and system transformation. And we're going to have some time uh, after that for questions if we keep things moving along uh, quickly. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we go right to the presentation. Uh, as I said, if you're joining us on the WebEx online, the information for that is available on uh, uh, to connect is available on the invite for this webinar. We encourage you to submit questions during today's presentation using the question box at the bottom right of your screen. As a reminder, uh, please make sure that when you're not speaking that the microphone on your telephone is muted. You can do this either by pressing the mute button on your phone or by pressing uh, star six. So star six to mute uh, or the mute button on your phone. When we get to questions, uh, I'll uh, tell you about how to unmute your phone. If you do experience any technical issues, uh, please feel free to call technical support at 1-866-229-3239. That's 866 2293239. So uh, we're going to get right into the presentations. I'd like to start out by introducing Joy Krieger, the Executive Director of the St. Louis Chapter of the Asthma and Allergy Foundations of America. And so Joy, if you're with us, uh, please make sure you're unmuted by pressing star seven. Uh, so that's star seven to unmute and go ahead. Uh, 
Catholic St. Louis. So from this moment forward, I will refer to it as such. So after St. Louis, through its asthma education and outreach program, identified a need in the community to provide our school nurses with not only the tools to provide an asthmatic child a treatment, but to also allow the school nurse to stock the necessary rescue medication for any child who may suffer an asthma attack at school. We realized this was a stretch. No other state had passed this law. We did, however, have the law from 2010 that allowed school nurses to stock epinephrine auto-injectors for anaphylaxis. This law mimics the language. We also identified the need for asthma education and healthy home assessments through our flagship program, BREATH, which stands for Bridging Resources to Encourage Asthma Treatment and Health. It's a prescription assistance program for the underserved and uninsured children. It's a unique program, and it's not offered anywhere else in the country but in St. Louis. So we wanted these kids through our program to receive the asthma education and home assessments outside the standard clinic setting for managing their asthma. In 2013, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid there's a rule. What? Oh. Uh, Joy, please Are go ahead. Are you not able to hear me? Oh no, we we can hear you. That's even we can hear you even better now. So if whatever okay. you're doing now, if you could keep doing that, that'd be great. Okay, I'm gonna do that. Okay. So in 2013, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid sent a ruling supporting our initiative, and we proceeded with submitting a policy brief to the Department of Social Services in Missouri, where we were granted the support to proceed with a budget bill. So you've already forwarded my slides, so keep it right there, please. I'm going to briefly go through our history of public policy and our timeline, then I'm going to explain the Missouri Asthma Program, then I'll explain Rescue Program, and then I'll finish with giving you grassroots explanations for our successes. Next slide, please. We have a short history when you think about it as far as legislation goes. Generally, it takes three to five years to get a law passed, but we formed our public policy that allowed school nurses to stock epinephrine auto-injectors for anaphylaxis. This law mimics the language. We also identified the need for asthma education and healthy home assessments through our flagship program, BREATH, which stands for Bridging Resources to Encourage Asthma Treatment and Health. It's a prescription assistance program for the underserved and uninsured children. It's a unique program, and it's not offered anywhere else in the country but in St. Louis. So we wanted these kids, through our program, to receive the asthma education and home assessments outside the standard clinic setting for managing their asthma. In 2013, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid There's a rule, what? Oh. Uh, Joy, please Are go ahead. Are you not able to hear me? Oh no, we we can hear you. That's even we can hear you even better now. So if whatever okay. you're doing now, if you could keep doing that, that'd be great. Okay, I'm going to do that. Okay, so in 2013, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid sent a ruling supporting our initiative, and we proceeded with submitting a policy brief to the Department of Social Services in Missouri, where we were granted the support to proceed with a budget bill. So you've already forwarded my slides, so keep it right there, please. I'm going to briefly go through our history of public policy and our timeline. Then I'm going to explain the Missouri Asthma Program. Then I'll explain Rescue Program. And then I'll finish with giving you grassroots explanations for our successes. Next slide, please. We have a short history when you think about it as far as legislation goes. Generally, it takes three to five years to get a law passed, but we formed our public policy committee in the fall of 2011, and we were, we were successful in getting our bill passed in July of 2012. It's also important to note that in order to get a bill passed, to follow it closely, because more often than not, it gets attached to another bill, and then it kind of gets killed in the process. But we were fortunate. It didn't get attached to anything else. Um, and so our bill passed successfully. And this bill we just was the emergency albuterol law for school nurses to stock. This led to notoriety among the school nurses, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So in 2014, we pursued a budget bill to reimburse for healthy home assessments and asthma education. So in 
So in May of 2014, it was passed by both the House and the Senate. And in June, it was vetoed by our governor, and he vetoed a lot of things that were new that year, last year. So in September, we went back to our legislators. They passed it again, and at the present time, it's being held by Governor Nixon. So in 2015, we feel very fortunate that the Department of Social Services in Missouri is very supportive of this budget bill. So it is in the budget, and right now our governor has a full budget for the state of Missouri, and we're waiting for him to sign that so that we can get this bill into action. Next slide, please. Missouri Asthma Program. Half the states in our country have asthma as a line item in their budget, their their state budget. But we are one of 26 or more states that is supported by a CDC grant. It's a five-year grant, and it was reinstated um, for it to go through 2019. And we have statewide partners that I can't. I have to mention that uh, we work with closely to, to achieve this. It is the Department of Health and the University of Missouri Women and Children's Hospital Pediatric Specialty Clinic in Columbia, Missouri. And we work with Dr. Ben Francisco, who is aware of all the asthma educators that happen to be scattered throughout our state. Then we have the Institute of Environmental Health Assessment and Patient-Centered Outcomes at Southeast Missouri State University. And the person is Dr. John Kramer, who oversees the home assessments, and he knows where all the home assessors are located throughout the state of Missouri. And then we have AFA St. Louis where we will be performing the asthma coaching and can also provide asthma educators for the St. Louis area if need be. So how this program works is that there's a 1-800 phone number set up at Southeast Missouri State at the Institute of Environmental Science. So the referrals are made and they've been identified as Medicaid asthma children who, through the data, have been identified for high need and high risk because they have frequent emergency visits, emergency department visits, frequent hospitalizations, overuse of their rescue medication, and frequent births of steroid medications. So the call comes in there, and that's when Dr. Um, Kramer's department then sources it out. And so what is determined from that is that each client will be followed for up to one year. Two to three home assessments will be done quarterly with telephonic asthma coaching in between the visits. There will also be two asthma education sessions. So the asthma education will be routed through Dr. Ben Francisco at the University of Missouri, and then Dr. Kramer will oversee the home assessments that are needed throughout the state. And they will all come together alongside AFA St. Louis, who will be providing the asthma coaching by phone. Only those with certification for asthma educator or home assessment will be able to bill Medicaid. Now, in order for us to work out all the details that will happen throughout the state, we have, began, we have begun monthly phone calls through the Department of Social Services that bring in all the partners around the state to kind of fill us in on how we're going to play this out once we implement it in hopefully July of this year. And there isn't any way that this program could be done without ongoing relationships with the various partners throughout the state. That's what makes it possible. Next slide, please. Rescue. That is something we came up with here, and it stands for Resources for Every School Confronting Unexpected Emergencies. We thought it was just the greatest name ever for what we do. And that's where we provide school nurses with asthma equipment. We provide spacers, nebulizers, tubing equipment and filters for the nebulizers, and peak flow meters. Now, the equipment per school is based on the number of students in the school and the ratio of identified children diagnosed with asthma. We also like that our schools have greater than 50% free and reduced lunch for their students, and the school must be within our geographic coverage region. Next slide, please. So here, here are some results I wanted to show you. So our, first of all, I wanted to share that our service region covers four counties in and around the St. Louis area. We also cover two counties in Illinois, but they do, they do not allow school nurses to administer albuterol without a specific physician order per child. So this is a pie graph of the schools we presently cover. You can see that 82.4% of the kids. Well, first of all, I'll tell you that how we got these results is we asked each of our partner schools 
we gave them three questions to the school nurses. We said every time you use our equipment, please answer these questions. One, did the child return to the classroom? Two, did you have to call the parent to come get the child and take them home? Or did you have to call an ambulance? So as you can see here, 82% returned to the classroom, 14% were sent home, and 1.7% were sent to the emergency room. So since the inception of this law in 2012, we, we have reports that 36% of all the public school districts in the state of Missouri have implemented this program. And some of those districts are the largest districts in the state. So when you look at that 82%, we've surmised the numbers show that we have saved the state of Missouri a half a million dollars alone in not having to call for an ambulance. We didn't take into account workforce labor, and we know that in the past, parents had to leave work and come get the children. Next slide, please. Here's an example of the schools that our AFA St. Louis has covered. So in 2011, you can see we had, we had our program, and we were delivering equipment to the schools as, as we always were. And then we started growing that. Now, I want to keep in mind that if, for any of you out there listening, we only have two program staff here in the office, plus myself, and I was a former school nurse, so I'm comfortable going out to the schools and speaking on behalf. But we did all we could to try to in, increase the um, equipment that our school nurses had at the time. So then we got our bill passed, as you can see there, March House Bill 1188, and we doubled the amount of equipment that we served. We have a partner pharmacy that we work with, and they provide free albuterol to all the schools. I kind of, kind of, I think crossed, got him crossed into doing this uh, reluctantly, but he was so thrilled. He's continued it every year. Next slide. So here I wanted to just say quickly about our successes. First of all, make every effort to engage your community partners. You must include all the universities, not just one and not just two, but it needs to be all of the universities around your state. You need to include your city and county health departments. They are so vital and so important. And any and all nonprofits who might touch asthma in any way, especially now that we're going into the homes, we, are, we have a coalition now on healthy and sustainable homes where we're bringing in nonprofits for any reason who go into the home so that we all know about our presence there. We also formed an asthma coalition a couple years ago. We hold quarterly meetings at a restaurant. We get a sponsor to support the food and drink it takes, and we invite any and all partners who touch asthma. And we have a speaker each time, and it lasts for about 10 minutes. And then we open it to everyone in the room is allowed to stand up and share what have you been doing and what is your program about if we don't know it. We also know that healthcare is stuck in a silo situation, and it's our job to keep the communications fluid. Make every effort to know your state leaders. Frequent visits to your state capital is vital. Also, you definitely need to be close with your Department of Health and your Department of Social Services. And depending on the political climate in your state, align yourself with the legislative champions. That's the only way to get this done. And of course, partner, partner, partner. Never say no to requests to partner in, in, in partner opportunities. Never accept no as an ending. Find the bottleneck or obstacle in the way and find avenues to resolve it. Make every effort to partner, even if it means there's no grant money in the pot for you this time around. Only build bridges. Be persistent. Thank you. Joy, thank you so much for putting so much information into a short and concise presentation. Just a reminder for everyone that we are going to have some time for questions and discussions after our set of presentations. And if you have any comments at this point that you'd like to uh, get into the queue, uh, you can use that tab on the uh, webinar uh, page at, at any point. Uh, right now, I'd like to turn to Dr. Kerry Sennett, the President and CEO of AFA, to help put uh, the presentation we just heard into the broader context around the challenges uh, surrounding optimal asthma care and the opportunities that communities have to provide better support and the opportunities to support them in turn. Kerry? Thanks, Mark. And Joy, thank you for sort of helping us understand that um, it is possible to do something here. And I think my 
my major message is um, I think that it is possible to do something, but that what we do really has to be focused at the level of the community. So um, I would like to talk about improving outcomes for people with asthma, subtitled It Takes a Village, because I think that it's important that we all recognize at the outset that um, solving the problem of asthma outcomes requires collaboration, requires coordination, um, and that there is no individual and no part of uh, the system that um, exclusively um, can accomplish this. So um, if you go to the first slide, please. Um, you know, where we're starting from, what we know, um, you know, first of all, many of you on the call know a lot about asthma, so I don't want to talk uh, in great detail about um, asthma and how we care for people with asthma, um, but I'd like to highlight four things that come out of the NHLBI's uh, Expert Panel Report 3, EPR 3, again, with which many of you, I'm sure, are familiar. And that has to do with the fact that um, effective management for people with asthma depends on really four things. Um, effective uh, diagnosis and assessment, which is something that takes place within the healthcare system. Um, appropriate and proper use of medication, which is largely something that we can turn to the healthcare system for, but also um, patient self-management, patient education and support so that patients are effective at managing their own health. Something that the healthcare system, I think, needs to contribute to, but something that um, has to take place on a much broader front because people live and work and play um, in many, many places outside of healthcare. And then finally, and, and critically, uh, improving outcomes for people with asthma depends on um, the environment, depends on eliminating from the environment or reducing um, in the environment the things that trigger asthma, allergens and uh, airborne pollutants. And the question is, well, who owns that? And the answer is, well, certainly not the healthcare system. And frankly, there is really no one that is responsible for air quality trigger management. So the question that that raises is how do we get um, the kind of coordination and collaboration that's needed in order to be able to provide support across those broad fronts? Again, we can turn to the healthcare system, we can beat on the healthcare system, do the diagnosis and assessment. And we can really, I think, depend on the healthcare system to help people understand what medications they need and how to use them. But in terms of supporting patients and, and enabling them to manage their own health, and in terms of dealing with the problems of air quality that are uh, a proximal cause of the acute asthma exacerbation, we need to work at the community level. We need to work outside of healthcare. And the problem is that the current systems that we have inside and around healthcare don't, aren't designed to drive or enable that coordination. We have a highly balkanized set of incentives where investments, for example, in schools and in programs like the one Joy has described, which may lead to improvements in outcomes and improvements in cost, um, are lead to reductions in cost for healthcare payers, but that doesn't create the resources that are needed to invest in school-based programs. So we have um, poorly aligned incentives and incentives that don't enable the kind of coordination and collaboration that we need. Now, having said all that, I think we've made some progress and actually some significant progress, so let me talk a little bit about that. Next slide, if you would, please. So the solution path as I see it depends on a number of things. First of all, a population health perspective, and I would argue a patient-centered view uh, in that. That is, we need to think about not the encounter between the patient and the healthcare system, but we need to think about managing the health of a population, and again, we need to think about that not from the medical perspective, but from the perspective of the patient who, for whom there are opportunities to support and improve outcomes far outside the healthcare system, um, in the workplace, um, in the schools, um, in, um, in places of worship. So we need to take a view that's a broad view and recognize that that patient-centered view implies uh, moving far beyond the healthcare system in a way that is um, coordinated and aligned with the work that takes place within the healthcare system. Uh, we need flexibility, adaptability, and local customization. Markets are different. Communities are different. They have different assets. They have different cultures. They're structured in different ways. 
And so the best way to move forward in a particular community will depend on that community. There is no one-size-fits-all solution, but rather there's the need to understand what are the capabilities and what are the resources and what is the culture in a particular community, and then leverage that to create the kind of change that we need to see. I've already commented on the need for um, incentives and better alignment of incentives. Um, with that, we need metrics. We need the data to inform those metrics, and those metrics need to be relevant to the problem we're trying to solve, which is how do we improve outcomes as patients perceive them? So again, bringing the patient's voice to the measurement process, I think, is a critical element of getting where we need to go, getting where we want to go. And then finally, this is a time when there's great change in healthcare. We want to capitalize on that, but we want to capitalize on that. We want to accelerate innovation, but we need to have a, a mechanism to study and learn from that innovation and disseminate not just what we learn, but the strategies that are effective in taking that knowledge or what we learned and actually deploying them in the marketplace. Next slide, please. So the good news is there is innovation. And um, what, I've, what I've done here is um, sort of gotten a little bit out in front. This is from a report that Apple will be releasing at 5 o'clock this evening. It's our Asthma Capitals Report, our 12th annual Asthma Capitals Report. Um, which is an assessment of the 100 largest communities, MSAs, in the United States with respect to their ability to create an environment that's friendly and supportive to people with asthma. And, and so cities are ranked from one, which is the most challenging place to live if you have asthma, to 100, which is the, the, the community that, that seems to have been most successful in terms of creating uh, an environment that supports people with asthma. And I encourage you to uh, sort of go seek out that report so that you can get some of the detail. Again, uh, the, the new report will be out at 5 o'clock, and the URL is on the slide. And the point I'd like to make from this slide, which looks at the five worst and five best communities, is that there's a lot of variation, and that in that variation there's an opportunity for us to learn. Um, we see variation in um, medical factors or medical outcomes, emergency room visits, use of quick relief medications, things that signal that uh, people with asthma are running into trouble. We see uh, threefold variation in um, mortality rates for people with asthma. But we also see that, that communities have been um, more or less successful at doing some of the things that are really important outside of healthcare. Um, introducing um, uh, legislation that creates smoke-free environment, um, dealing with problems of air quality. So the point is that there have been some successes, and in that there's an opportunity for us to learn. Next slide, please. And we are learning. And um, this is um, truly hot off the press uh, from the Brookings Institution last week, a case study in payment reform to support optimal pediatric asthma care. So again, um, the innovation that's out there, we need to capture it, we need to bring, we need to, to sh uh, shine a light on it, um, and, but it is happening. Next slide, please. And finally, we're not only innovating, we're not only learning from that innovation, but there are vehicles out there to help us spread that knowledge. Um, this is uh, the EPA's asthmacommunitynetwork.org, which is for me probably the go-to site if you want to know about what's happening at the community level and, and you want to know who to talk to about it, um, I, I, I couldn't encourage more strongly that you start with this site. Um, another resource that's uh, extremely valuable, and I don't want Paul Garvey's inbox to be flooded, but the CDC, again, is a tremendous resource if you want to understand what is happening and what is having an impact at the community level. Next slide. But I don't think it's time for us to relax. I don't think we can get complacent. We are making progress, but there are still 25 million Americans with asthma, more than $50 billion spent annually on the care of those people, um, much of that to pay for half a million hospitalizations, many of which are not needed and represent not only poor use of resource, but represent a compromise in the quality of life of those individuals. So there are millions and millions of Americans whose lives are limited much more than they need to be. We have the science. What we need is community-based action to facilitate the translation and the implementation of that science um, into practice, not just medical practice, but into all of the uh, touch points between people with asthma and their community. And um, I, my, my bottom line is the glass here is half empty. I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to accelerate, and I'm hoping that coming out of this, we'll see some acceleration. 
Thank you. Carrie, thanks very much for the presentation. Once again, if any comments or questions, please use the tab at the bottom right of the webinar screen. Uh, now, we've heard about an example of uh, closing some of these gaps between uh, uh, the opportunities in, in community supports and uh, the outcomes for patients with asthma. Carrie's provided a, a broader uh, national context and framework for uh, closing some of these gaps. Now I'd like to turn to Dr. Stephen Cha, the Medical Director for Medicaid at CMS. Uh, to hear about some of the things that uh, uh, the Medicaid program and CMMI or CMS um, uh, are doing uh, to uh, help create opportunities to support these reforms in care through alternative payment me mechanisms and through new kinds of state partnerships. Uh, uh, Medicaid is a, a huge part of care delivery in this country, and particularly for patients and children with asthma. So, uh, Dr. Shaw, thanks very much for taking time with us today. Thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, this is Steve Cha, and uh, I am the Chief Medical Officer here at CMCS. I'm, I'm also, uh, for the last month, I guess, taking on a short-term detail to be the Acting Group Director over at the State Innovations Group over at CMMI. So, you know, there's so much activity going on from the state perspective around these issues, and excited to be with you all. And I think Carrie and Joy both set me up very well um, in terms of the talk, and I'll touch on some of the key points they made. Next slide. So w w as of our most recent reports, as of this week, over 70 million now rely on Medicaid and CHIP. And, and I say that by way of saying this is a program that has huge impact in terms of our nation, as, as Mark was mentioning, nearly half of births, one of every three kids. Um, and I, I think this is a key fact, and I'm going to come back to this in a second, but we are a joint state-federal program that has enormous impact and also presents us with enormous opportunities, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, uh, in terms of resources, I think Carrie and Joy mentioned a few, but uh, one that was just off the presses last uh, a few weeks ago was a brief put out by the NGA in collaboration with the CDC. And one number for Medicaid is at $10 billion annually in spending for asthma. And, and just a, a pointer to the, the impact of, of this particular condition on our program and the need for us to, to take a look here. Next slide. So you, you hear this language from, from us CMS folks here all the time, but we are in fact working together in partnership to propel positive change forward to achieve that improved health of populations, improved experience of care, and reduced trends and cost. And I, I put this slide up because, not just because we are part of CMS and so we have to say these sorts of things, but I think it's a change in stance for CMS as well, for CM, CMCS as well in particular, which is really trying to think about not just how do we pay the bills, how do we ensure the program integrity, but how do we really envelop and enhance these partnerships with states to really think about how do we propel that, that positive change forward through broad efforts and partnerships. Next slide. And so the driving question for us, has, it, we are really trying to transform the driving question from one of simply saying, what does our authority say and where are our flexibilities in statute, although obviously that's critical. But we're trying to reframe the question, particularly with our state partners, in terms of saying how are policies supporting or sometimes hindering the best practices on the ground to achieve that three-part aim. We really want to think about not just what does our program allow, what does our program not allow, but what should our program allow and how should we be thinking about changing and reforming our program moving forward. And this is the key point, and I think, in relevance to the conversation today. And I think we hear a lot about this in terms of this, this term population health, which um, I, I find, I, find I, I have trouble understanding what exactly that means. But I will tell you one piece that we certainly take to heart, which is that we strive for that seamless set of services across silos to serve our beneficiaries. That is to say, we shouldn't think about what's my job, what's your job, and the other's job, but how are we working together to support that whole person, whole health mentality of our beneficiaries and what they need, whether it's HUD, whether it's uh, CMS, whether it's EPA, whether it's our other partners on, on this call today, how do we think about who is the best entity, best situated to best um, deliver those services for our goals? And we have to be that partner in prevention. Next slide. Uh, I, I think many of you are familiar with many of these challenges. In terms of that idea of, of silos at the state level, in terms of trying to think about how does Medicaid work with met public health, with mental health, chronic disease versus substance abuse and perinatal, we have all sorts of disparate agencies and strategies at the federal level. So a problem like pediatric asthma and asthma in particular becomes one of crossing silos and becomes a challenge of, of politics and organizations rather than of interventions in medicine. And I think in some respects that's disheartening. And on the positive frame, I would say 
that this presents an opportunity. This isn't to say that we don't know what we have to do for these kids. We don't know. It's not a matter of not knowing what the medical intervention is. It's a matter of how can we align and organize our systems better to achieve the impacts that we know are absolutely possible out there in the world today. But it is a challenge. Um, next slide. So this is a slide I just wanted to pause on for a quick, uh, for a second here. You know, just wanted to quick bust through the first few slides, which the intro slides. This is really where the heart of where our work has been for the last few years. And some of these are authorized by the ACA and some of these are not. But I just wanted to highlight a few in particular in relation to asthma. So we have our Health Homes Authority, and this is authorized under the Affordable Care Act. It allows us to provide 90-10 matching for two years to a state that's trying to support a health home as we've defined it under statute for our beneficiaries. And in particular, I want to note that 10 states now have a health home to support um, a health home that, that addresses the needs of people with asthma. And although I have to say I'm not sure exactly which authority Joy was talking about in her opening slide deck, and maybe she can touch back on this in questions, but I suspect that, that it was another Missouri effort to try and think about health homes in terms of that 90-10 match. And again, it just allows us to amplify that state's impact and that state's investments um, by, by a, a magnitude order. And I think we are working with a lot of states and with flexible ways to use that authorities and use those uh, spending in terms of supporting the full vision of, of, of uh, supporting a, a beneficiary with asthma. Um, I also wanted to highlight managed care flexibilities, that over 60% of our beneficiaries are now in a capitated arrangement. And what we know from reports like uh, uh, the Medicaid Health Plans of America put out a report recently on this topic, um, we know that a lot of plans are, in fact, very focused on asthma. Um, look at that $10 billion in spending, uh, and I think you can understand why a lot of our plans are trying to think about how can we do this better? How do we think about those flexibilities under the managed care umbrella to better address and use those flexibilities to support a wide range of personnel to support the people that we serve? Um, the third bullet here is integrated care models, and this is a series of letters that the Center of Medicaid and CHIP Services has put out over the last few years highlighting flexibilities that states um, heretofore may not have understood that that were available under them under the current regs. And this is another example of where we've been trying to think about, well, how can we think about our regs to support the world that we want to support and not simply staying with the, 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 what the regs say on their face. And in terms of thinking about some of these authorities that have been used in a variety of, uh, of ways and fashions, trying to think about more forward-leaning ways to support that. So we have states like Minnesota, and now I think we're up to six states now, thinking about shared savings in this space. And along with that, some flexibility in terms of the spending for some of that funding. Um, we have Arkansas, who's thinking about episode-based cares, episodes-based care in terms of, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, episode-based care payments. And, and I think, uh, and Arkansas in particular does have a bundle focused around asthma. So you, you see a, a number of ways in which we're using this particular integrated care model authority in new and creative ways. Um, I think we may have a slide problem, but um, the, the, the next bullet is really thinking about some of our 1115 waiver authority, uh, and I think we have a number of states with some of these broad systems delivery reform, California, Massachusetts, Texas, Oregon, um, and I think Massachusetts in particular with a targeted waiver, uh, which goes to the next bullet, really thinking about delivery reforms under a waiver, uh, and I think that's uh, a lot of what facilitated Massachusetts to stand up their particular effort. Um, we have other efforts under the Affordable Care Act, not the least of which is the state innovations model, which I'm not a group director for, but we have a lot of states really thinking about how do we bring together that whole state uh, population focused um, activity to bring health care and health delivery and health systems all together to serve our beneficiaries. Um, we have our Medicaid Quality Measurement Program, which is really trying to stand up our ability to measure, and I think Carrie touched on a few of these points in terms of our need to have metrics around this. Medical, med medication management for people with asthma is now part of our core set uh, for, for Medicaid. And finally, the Adult Quality Grants, which are a series of grants to assist states in supporting change around some of those core sets. So as you can see from the slide, just a whole range of authorities that we've been trying to think about. How do we think about the full range of our regulations and all the flexibilities we have um, in terms of thinking about how we support state innovation on this front? Next slide. A lot of attention is focused on this particular uh, rule change, which was a final rule we put out in July of 2013. Uh, which is really trying to think about how do we put together some of our and align all of our statutory provisions together. The bottom line here is that providers who may not have a license may be permitted to provide services when recommended by a physician or other licensed personnel. 
So I think this is uh, uh, often referred to as our non-licensed provider rule. Uh, and I think we are, in fact, proud of this change. This was, I think, a symbol of our efforts to try and overcome the barriers that exist out there today, and we're excited about this. I think, as many of you know, we have not had a state yet come in the door for this particular rule. But I do want to frame up the answer for why that's happening, which is that we've had a lot of states uh, like Missouri come in through the door to say we're interested in this particular provision and realize that we have other provisions like our health home authority, like our managed care flexibilities to support what the state wants to do without having to go through the process of, uh, of coming in the door for this particular rule change. So while, while we have not had a state come in the, through the door, I think the learning process that we've had since this time is that the bottom line is that we have a number of flexibilities that can support that model. And coming back to that original driving question I framed up on the slide a few slides ago, which is how can we support the best practices on the ground and what's the best and most efficient way to support our state partners? This hasn't been the route that our, all of our states have needed, and we've been trying to think about uh, our best and most easiest route to support our state partners. Next slide. So this is just my final slide just to say we are excited and stand ready to part with states and providers and st stakeholders to think about how we accelerate that pathway towards uh, better health, better care, and lower costs. And again, to highlight, there are multiple pathways to reform. And, and uh, again, wanted to come back to both with stakeholders and states alike, rather than coming in the door to say we want a waiver or we want a change in the non-licensed provider, but rather to say what's that model you're standing up and how can we most efficiently and most substantively support that vision in working with you and our state partners. Um, and I fi the final note I just want to say is that uh, – uh, Carrie put up that, that, that stat about variation, and we find that is, in fact, the hallmark for Medicaid. It's variation across the board in terms of how we're thinking about that. And the last effort I just wanted to mention, not on the slide, is our efforts under the Medicaid Innovation Accelerator Program, which is a technical assistance program to really think about how do we support our state partners to learn the best lessons, to understand what are the best quality metrics, the best data uh, systems, and how to best navigate these pathways in terms of moving down towards this pathway towards change. So just in conclusion, I think whether it's the authorities we have, whether it's the technical assistance we're providing to wrap around those authorities, we're really excited to try and think about how do we work with you all to support these kinds of models. Thank you. Steve, thanks so much for covering so much ground and with that uh, goal orientation, uh, uh, clearly a lot of opportunities in Medicaid today to support these kinds of goals and uh, uh, it was very helpful in getting a sense of the, the full array of opportunities out there. Uh, I would now like to turn to Dr. Steve Farmer who's going to highlight some of the themes that we've heard about uh, so far during the webinar and also uh, focus on some strategies for sustainable payment and uh, healthcare delivery system transformation. Steve? Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chaw and all of today's webinar participants for your insightful comments. Uh, I'm Dr. Steve Farmer, Associate Professor of Medicine and Health Policy at George Washington University and a visiting scholar at Brookings. As we learned today, a large number of non-medical organizations play important roles in achieving optimal asthma care, um, and there is substantial evidence already showing that non-traditional asthma services, including home assessment and environmental remediation, services along with other intensive patient-centered and culturally appropriate education interventions can reduce costs and improve outcomes for high-risk asthma patients. What is less clear is how best to align the system to deliver and pay for non-traditional services and how best to build quality assurance into community-based programs and across uh, stakeholders. Existing payment mechanisms lead to fragmented care in siloed organizations, making it difficult to provide optimal asthma care and to sustain community-based asthma programs. The medical community is not well suited to providing environmental assessment and re remediation services, nor is there a clear mechanism for coordinating or contracting with community and public health providers in the fee-for-service model. So achieving delivery and system transformation will require system realignment through new payment models, which will break down the silos between the medical and social service communities. Many provider types or organizations that stand to contribute to improved asthma outcomes are not eligible for reimbursement under fee-for-service. Most of these organizations also lack legal authority to regulate the home environment, uh, and as healthcare costs have risen, funding for social services have often fallen as, uh, at the same time. Additionally, both the medical community and public health and social service providers have a multitude of competing disease and health priorities. 
So achieving delivery and systems transformation will require system realignment through payment models which break down the silos between the medical and social service communities. Uh, these payment models will need to transition away from service-based payment towards person and population-based payment that encourage collaboration across the continuum of care. As, as several of our prior speakers have mentioned, there is no one-size-fits-all solution that can be applied to every community, and delivery system transformation will vary. Uh, Ms. Krieger successfully engaged state legislators, schools, and academic medical centers to achieve improvements in asthma care. Other programs have different circumstances and will take different approaches. Urban, rural, low-income, and high-income areas have different needs and different resources available. In some cases, physician practices may have to facilitate services independently. In, other words, in others, where community and public health resources are um, better developed, physicians may refer patients to existing services. System transformation will take time and will have many different flavors, but ideally, clinicians and asthma programs should leverage existing resources to improve efficiency and minimize costs. For example, in, in most states, the CDC has partnered with state and local health departments to gather epidemiologic data, including asthma prevalence rates and ED usage related to asthma. School districts also have a wealth of information regarding school absenteeism. Asthma programs should not recreate these existing surveillance programs, but should rather use these data to target interventions to those patients who would benefit the most. On average, each primary care physician may have only five or ten high-risk asthma patients who require enhanced services. Hiring community health workers uh, for every practice to perform home assessments or nurses to do specific in-clinic education may not be, economic feasible, be economically feasible in every instance. An alternative solution would be for hospitals and physicians to contract with community and public health entities to provide those services across all hospitals and practices in a geographic area or where community and public health resources are not well developed. Practices and hospitals may train nurses and community health workers to extend care for high-risk patients with multiple different disease types that require specialized interventions. Given differences in local health system infrastructure and the type of innovations being delivered, different types of alternative payment models will be needed. It is important that these models work synergistically and complement the needs of the population and the infrastructure at hand. A variety of payment models exist as shown on this figure. As you move to the right, uh, uh, the, the ability to break down silos and provide enhanced asthma care becomes greater. In some cases, a shift to person or population level payment through comprehensive capitation may not be possible or even necessary. Um, however, given its limitations, a change from fee for service is required. Payers have been reluctant to extend the spectrum of services under fee for service because of concerns that healthcare costs are already too high and that non traditional services potentially expand the scope of medical coverage, and moreover, that these services might not be always used as intended. The benefit of these services has been demonstrated only in the highest risk patients. If clinicians were to apply them indiscriminately, the services are likely to add costs without proving, improving patient outcomes. So without a phasing, uh, stable funding stream, building and maintaining community-based services will be a challenge uh, in the uh, existing fee-for-service model. In the absence of fee-for-service payments, many community-based asthma programs have relied on grant funding or in-kind donations. Grant funding mechanisms are largely intended to help establish programs and to demonstrate a proof of concept, and so sustainability of grant-funded programs is a chronic concern. Efforts directed to obtaining and maintaining grant funding and substantial constraints on how grant funds can be used uh, often decrease the efficiency of these programs. As an incremental shift away from fee-for-service, some payers have constructed add-on payments which are layered on top of fee-for-service, uh, existing fee-for-service mechanisms. The payment is usually a small, risk-adjusted, per-member-per-month payment. This approach is becoming more common, especially for medical homes, and it can be used as a way to support upfront investments in infrastructure, 
or for patient-centered interventions such as in-clinic education and asthma home visits. Add-on payments are relatively simple to administer and do not necessarily require fundamental changes to the fee-for-service structure. However, many of them do not cover the full cost of services provided and many of the underlying distortions of fee-for-service remain in this uh, scenario. The shift to person or population payments holds promise for greater care transformation and for sustainable funding of, existing, of extended services for high-risk asthma patients. These new models further shift the emphasis to delivery of value-oriented services and offer greater opportunities for innovation. Partial capitation and capitated payments are fixed per member per month or per member per year payments that are adjusted for case mix and quality attainment. As the health system continues to transition away from fee-for-service payment and implements new payment models, collection of patient-centered outcome measures will be critical to ensure that new care approaches truly are improving the value of care delivered. Many current asthma measures are process-oriented, represent narrow elements of care, and do not directly reflect improvements in patient health. Payers need to move beyond performance measures based simply on administrative claims. Rather, patient-centered outcome measures are needed to assess uh, whether health is actually improving. At a recently convened AFA Brookings Roundtable on asthma, for example, one participant suggested overlaying school absenteeism data with clinical data as a means to track improvements in asthma control. Clinicians, in turn, need to get timely feedback on their patients to allow them to efficiently identify struggling patients and adjust care strategies when adjustments are required. In the future, greater reimbursement and payment will be tied to patient outcomes. Policymakers need to be cognizant of the fact that much of health is determined outside the control of medical professionals and broader efforts to address non-clinical contributors to poor health are needed. For example, there are currently only two states with indoor air regulations, even though the Department of Health and Human Services has made such regulations a priority. Evolving payment models need to be transparent about how clinicians will be evaluated and paid and may need to broaden accountability beyond clinical uh, providers to include schools, public health departments, and public housing. One possible solution proposed at a recent Brookings AFA roundtable is to allow states to share in Medicaid savings if they enact certain social and environmental regulations and protocols. New payment models will be more effective for conditions like asthma if they are able to improve coordination and support between uh, the clinical system and non-clinical interventions. There are a number of actionable next steps that policymakers and providers can take to improve the control of asthma in the community. In addition to implementation of new payment models, local, state, and federal departments of health should help to coordinate initiatives around asthma, potentially by establishing an exchange which facilitates access to services such as community health workers and environmental remediation services. Policymakers and payers must recognize that factors beyond conventional care impact upon patient outcomes for patients with asthma. New payment models can allow clinicians greater flexibility in addressing the root causes of illness, but will come with accountability for costs and outcomes. New payment models must be aligned with valid metrics of successful asthma management. Thank you for your attention. Steve, uh, thanks very much for that presentation. I guess the second Steve, uh, uh, Steve Farmer. Um, and uh, I want to thank all of you who have sent in questions and comments in the interest of getting through as many of them as quickly as possible. Uh, I'm going to try to co uh, um, condense those and, and combine them in a few follow-up questions. So for all of our presenters, please make sure your phone is not on mute. And I'm going to do a few uh, follow-ups. And I want to start with uh, the theme that uh, Steve Farmer just ended on about the importance of measuring impact here. That, uh, uh, as Steve said, a lot of concerns from uh, payers in healthcare that given the tightness of budgets, they uh, are nervous about just adding on additional payments for additional services without some tie not only in previous research, but in how those programs are actually being implemented in real world populations that they're actually leading to uh, improvements in um, outcomes, in this case related to uh, uh, asthma, the triple aim as, uh, as Steve Shaw uh, described it. So let me, let's go to where we are with uh, asthma performance measurement right now. And Carrie, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, a few people asked about the asthma capitals report, which seem to have a number 
of uh, um, asthma-related measures included in it. Uh, so one narrow question first. Uh, one of the participants asked about whether the uh, statistic for 100% smoke-free public place laws uh, was also included some statistics about moving towards smoke-free multi-unit housing as well. But if you could also expand on that into some, what you see as some of the other promising regional-level asthma outcome measures that are included in that report and that could be built upon uh, to accomplish these uh, goals of alignment uh, in payment and supporting community-based efforts. So the the narrow question, the answer to that is um, uh, regrettably no. The, there are four laws that um, we track that have to do with smoke-free workplaces, smoke-free bars, smoke-free restaurants, and smoke-free cars when they're minors. So it, it, I think the suggestion that we broaden to begin to look at other things is a very valid one, and um, and, and we will. Um, you know, in terms of what are the other metrics that are available here, I mean, I think there are. Uh, there are a number of metrics that are currently out there. I think the problem may be a little bit that there are too many. If you look at a Healthy People 2020, for example, there are a broad set of metrics that are relevant to tracking outcomes for people with asthma um, at the community level as well as at the national level. Um, some of the metrics that are in our report are drawn from that set. Um, many of them are um, metrics that are uh, uh, incorporated because they're feasible. I think one of the great challenges, and, I'm, and Steve Farmer, I think, made this point, that as we drive more and more attention towards, as we create incentives that begin to drive more and more attention to improving outcomes for people with asthma, we really need to find ways to capture the voice of the patient with asthma. What, it, what matters to a person with asthma is not whether they're adherent with medication or even whether there's a law that, uh, that provides for a smoke-free environment but whether they're able to sleep at night or if they're a child, whether they're able to play soccer. So it's the symptoms and the impact that those have on life that I think we really need to begin to capture, and I think we have the technology to do that. Um, and I would like to see much more investment in efforts to really bring patient-centered outcomes measurement uh, to life and also to link that to the incentive programs going forward. And obviously, I would like to see the Asthma Capitals Report uh, begin uh, be a leading part of that. Uh, th thanks very much, Carrie. And Steve uh, Chaw, if you're uh, still with us, uh, you also talked a bit about the importance of measures and about how uh, the increasing uh, data that, that CMS is developing related to asthma care is showing important variation in results and in practices around the country. Now, you went through a number of ways in which states can work with CMS and the Medicaid managed care plans and the providers in states. Uh, can work with CMS to direct more resources to these kinds of uh, efforts, but I'm assuming that you're also uh, finding that those need to be tied to measures, and uh, maybe you could expand a little bit on where you see the, the best opportunities for applying uh, uh, these kinds of uh, alternative payment models and support uh, for community-based care, how you see those being tied to uh, performance measures showing uh, the states and, uh, uh, and also CMS uh, and, and the public that uh, this is actually resulting in progress. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think, um, you know, Steve Farmer's slide with, with that sort of XY graph in terms of the kinds of models is relevant here because I think the more you're getting towards that shift towards value-based value, value -based reimbursement, the more that CMS is going to look and rely upon more robust uh, measures to, to, to guarantee, uh, to demonstrate patient, uh, improvement in patient outcomes. You know, as you get to the more the right side of his slide in terms of thinking about um, you know, add-on payments, uh, PMPMs. I think we've been more accommodating in terms of trying to think about states that are trying to think about how they want to engage on this pathway. So I, I think we've tried to be appropriate in terms of the amount of risk to beneficiaries in the public fisc and, and ask for a quality uh, outcome that, that sort of matches that, that level of robustness. The other thing I'll say is that with regard to some of the waivers, I think that, for instance, Massachusetts um, were engaged in, in a demonstration, and I would say a true demonstration, and the kind of evaluation, I think, in recent years with these 1115s, in Massachusetts in particular, that we haven't done in past years to a certain degree. I think we're looking towards those to give us some better data about what the outcomes are here in terms of what we're getting for these investments and what we're not. So I think we're trying to be uh, proportional, and I think we're trying to learn as we go here. 
Uh, interesting. Thanks. And, and Joy, uh, since you're on the ground uh, implementing one of these reforms, several of the comments that came in were along the lines of, well, you know, it's very impressive to see the progress that you made. And by the way, several requests uh, for more information on the specifics of the bill that you were able to pass and how the state budget uh, is handling that. If there's more that you can send along, be happy to make it available to the participants. Um, but if you could just expand a little bit on sort of what's in it for, for everybody uh, in this effort. And in particular, you mentioned uh, a pharmacy that's donating the asthma uh, equipment. Uh, what, what do they get out of that contribution? How have you made this uh, uh, really work uh, to be in the interests of all of the participants who have to work together in new ways? Well, first of all, I wanted to comment. Dr. Cha was referring to what he thought the 90-10 health home model is what we were using in Missouri with a bill we just got passed. And it it wasn't from that one. This has nothing to do with health home. This was from the uh, ruling that CMMS came out with January of 2014 specifically for providing asthma education and healthy home assessments outside the clinical care setting. It was part of the preventive services part of CMMS. So I just wanted to touch on that to clear to clear that up. Um, the partner pharmacy that we work with, they don't provide any equipment free. That comes from my agency. And as all nonprofits listening in on the phone know, you're only as good as your last grant and fundraiser. So we have a very devoted group of of people that work in within our organization that do all that we can to raise money so that we can help more and more people in our community. So the, pres- the prescription assistance program that we provide here in St. Louis, they have a certain income level. It's 200% uh, percent of the FPL that families can then apply and receive free medication for their kids. Uh, and so we partner with a pharmacy exclusively and he gathers our data and keeps us on track. We know when someone's overusing or underusing their medications. And it was through that relationship that I then said to him, hey, if I get this law bill passed, will you provide free albuterol? Albuterol is rather inexpensive. If you get the nebulizer, nebulizer form, you can get um, 24 in a box, and it's under $10. And how we work with our schools is if we have schools that are in affluent areas, who clearly have a parent-teacher organization that can support a budget to provide this for their schools. We encourage that. We really only want to have um, the pharmacy that we work with give the albuterol to those schools that have a need. And the other thing that's a huge need out there is free epi auto-injectors for anaphylaxis. Myelin has been awesome for the past couple of years providing every school across the country, public school, free auto injectors, which is the EpiPen through Myelin, for the schools to stock. So we encourage that as well. Great. Uh, Joy, thanks for making clear, you know, this is something that Steve Shaw made and mentioned in his remarks, but some of the value of the just local community level involvement in finding the particular gaps and especially the best opportunity to close those gaps given the needs and resources in the community. I think what we've talked about here today is how to match that up with more systematic changes that can take place uh, in payment systems. Steve Cha went through uh, a whole set of initiatives now underway uh, in uh, Medicaid, and uh, Steve Farmer uh, framed those in terms of smaller versus larger shifts away from from fee-for-service payments that go with uh, less versus more flexibility to to support these kinds of uh, changes in uh, delivery of care and changes in uh, uh, community engagement, but also with uh, more accountability that uh, uh, you are able to track and and show that uh, these uh, newer, more significant reforms really are translating into better results at at the community level. This is obviously a set of issues that's very much in progress, but hopefully what you've taken away today that is that while we may still be at the uh, glass half full phase, as Carrie uh, put it, uh, and we still have a lot of uh, glass to fill up, uh, there are probably more opportunities and more knowledge about how to fill that glass than we've ever had before. Uh, we'll be staying involved in uh, these issues here at uh, uh, the Brookings Institution and our Merkin Initiative and our collaboration with AFA. Uh, We hope that you'll stay in touch with us as well as opportunities to make further progress in improving asthma care and linking 
clinical and community-based care continue to evolve. I want to let you know that the uh, website, uh, the, the uh, webinar uh, and the slides will be available on our website uh, after the conclusion of this event, uh, and we're happy to follow up with you all if there are any additional specific questions as well. I want to end by thanking AFA and the Merkin Initiative for their financial support uh, of this uh, um, webinar and our staff here at the Center for Health Policy for uh, the technical work and coordination of this event. And most of all, thanks to all of you for joining us and for your continued efforts and leadership around improving uh, asthma care and asthma patient outcomes in the United States. Thank you all and have a great afternoon.